Hello, um, I'm Katie Cottingham, and welcome to this news briefing from the 251st National Meeting and Exposition of the American Chemical Society in San Diego. We're joined today by Dr. Paul Gattenholm from the Wallenberg Woods Science Center at Chalmers, Sweden. He will be talking to us about 3D printing cartilage to fix nose, knees, noses, and ears. So Dr. Gattenholm. Good morning, everybody. I just came all the way from Sweden to share with this great news. So we start with wood, which is plenty of wood in Sweden. It grow everywhere. And we have a wood chips, which we actually divide with homogenizing to very fine cream. We call it the microfibers, cellulose microfibers. Some people call them nanofibrils. And then we go to ocean and get some algae and we extract the alginate. Both materials are prepared in the, in the uh, uh, sterile way, so they are first a clean extraction and then sterilization process. We mix those two components to something what we call the bio-ink. It's a, like a fine cream, uh, maybe like a ketchup almost. It's, <laughs> it's have a very interesting shear thinning properties. So it's a hydrogel with high viscosity at low shear stress. So what we do with that uh, later, we load it into the syringe in the cell mixer, which we have developed ourselves. And in the second syringe, we put the stem cells or the primary cells, like the cartilage cells, the chondrocytes. And it, with, with this device, we mix them here in the small extruder. So we get a cartridge here, which contains the stem cells and this bio ink. Well, that bio ink have extremely good printability. So we can print the grids, call it the grids, material with a very fine structure. Why is that important? Because the oxygen and nutrient can come to the cells. So when they come to the cells, the cell will grow. And we can print very complex structure like ear, meniscus, or the nose. And we have done first in vitro study showing the cartilage grow, but we also have done in vivo study. We put the human chondrocytes from the nose together with the stem cells in that bio ink and printed the structures and put into the mouse. And after 60 days, we found a lot of human cartilage grow. And actually the stem cells, which were together with cartilage, with chondrocytes, they stimulate a lot of chondrocytes. So we haven't seen differentiation of the stem cells into chondrocytes. Chondrocytes, because the crosstalk with the stem cells, proliferated, there were a lot of them, and they, provide, and they grown the human cartilage. Another very interesting finding was a good mechanical properties of this hydrogel with uh, printed cells. We implanted it directly after printing, so no incubation in the incubator, printing and in the animal. And they had a great mechanical properties after two months, they looks like a cartilage, and we've seen a lot of vascularization. So the, the, blood vessels has grown in between this material. I think this is a huge achievement. Thank you so much. Great. Um, so do we have any questions? Please remember to state your name and affiliation when you're asking your question. So it's Kath O'Driscoll from Chemistry and Industry magazine. I guess the first question, is it, is it a nose that you've grown on the mouse? We've been, it, it was, it, it is just a, uh, a flat surface now, but, but there's, the, the, the cells come from the nose uh, cartilage. Okay. And how long would it take to grow something like a nose on the mouse? Then? It will probably take a, more than two months. Two months. Uh, what is the sort of the long-term application? And what would you actually envisage being able to do? Um, would you grow these tissues on? So the, the both short and long term is going to be plastic surgery now. We, we work with plastic surgeon and you have a lot, lot of defects in, or, or after surgery, after cancer surgery or trauma, the, the pieces of a soft tissue which are missing. This could be nose, could be ear, could be actually the discs, the spinal disc. Later on, we think a lot about the knee, the, the cartilage in the knee. So you can print with human cells and you can implant and the human cartilage grow directly. And also you can do it in the, exactly the shape of a defect. And we also show that the cells not only survive, but they proliferate, they produce um, the cartilage. I think I'm right in, in saying that other people have been 3D printing um, tissues as well using scaffolds and things. I'm just wondering what's special about your Bio -ink. Very good question. So uh, all the scaffold technology which has been out for the last uh, 20 years is, is uh, based on that you produced the, the scaffold and you seed the cells on that. 
And the cells are difficult to seed, they are difficult to migrate, they are difficult to stavor. The difference, what we are doing now, that we have a hydrogel where we mix the cells together. And then we print, and because one of the components is it's a alginate, we cross-link it with calcium. So the cells are, are actually in this very wet environment, but they are encapsulated. So they cannot come in, out. They cannot, the other cells cannot come in. But nutrients come in. And, and, the, and the, what is really special about the ink we have developed, we call it bio-ink, it's a very good printing fidelity. We can print those fine lines, and the fine lines are crucial for the oxygen transport and for nutrient transport. Because if you print the ear like this on this picture, with the full ear, and you put the cells inside, cells will die, because there's no oxygen transport. But if you make the grid structure with, with the holes between, uh, and the cells are sitting in that structure, so in the hydrogels, then the nutrients can come. And what was surprising for us, that the spontaneous vascularization. We haven't expected that. So it's, it's a very good sign. So you actually get blood vessels? Blood, mouse blood vessels coming into, into you know, material. And, and not human, because we haven't put anything human How there. How does it compare with actually um, you know, human cartilage then, the tissue that you're producing, how does it actually compare with the, the stuff that we, we produce in the body? It's, it's a, it's, we are not that yet on the mechanical properties after two months. We probably need to increase some, some cell concentration, but we have all the components which we, which, we, which we have in human cartilage. So we have collagen too, we have proteoglycans, uh, we have a good cell behavior. And, and I think that uh, what is new about what we have done is that's, that we show that this pretty bioprinting technology, it's a bi we call it a bioprinting because it's, it's, we use it as a, as a gel, uh, as, as a bioink, is uh, moving closer to hospital. We actually have a startup company, uh, can we talk about it? Or is it, uh, call it Cell Inc. And this company start to market this uh, bioink, call it Cell Inc. and, and uh, through, the, through the web shop. But they realize that they're still, it's very exclusive technology. So we, the printer are very expensive. They are not specially made for the, for the surgery room. So this company actually have developed its own printer called Incredible, which they sell for $5,000, which is specially made for this material. Uh, since launch in November, they sold 30 printers to US, so to Asia, to Europe. And now they are working with a regulatory um, a regulatory body to start the process of making this printer to operation room. Uh, because it's, it's very simple, it's like a coffee machine, and you need to have a approval to, for, for use. So the first application will be autologous tissue. So, you know, the surgeons are moving a lot of both fat, skin, but also the cartilage and bone from patients, from one place to another place. So we see if we get this printer approved to the surgery room, the, pre the sergeants will have a tool. The next step will be regulatory approval of a bio-ink. So, uh, so this is our, our plan and, and, and vision. Do you expect to get these approvals for surgery and for the bio-ink? I, I don't know, but it shouldn't take very long time because the materials have a clinical relevance. They are used in, in clinics today. They are medical approved. Uh, so it is always a, a question to discuss, of course, with FDA, if, if this is a, a biomedical device. Uh, this is actually non-biodegradable, so it should go a little faster. It's, it's a biological polymers, which are non-animal derivatives. When did you patent this then? And, uh, we patented it about two years ago. And you've published as well on? We published after that, and then we started the company. The uh, company has started now in the end of January uh, as a young... Sorry, what did you say the first application would be, likely be? I, I think the first application will be to... Uh, if we not think about the bio-ink, we think about the 3D printing as we develop technology, will be probably to print actually ears and the bone, you see, the surgeons today, uh, the only way, in, either you have a prosthesis, which is a silicon plastic, or the surgeon actually take the, the cartilage under the ribs from the patients. And they carve it and make the ear of that for a patient. So the first application will be to, instead of carving, to, to make the, the smoothie, I call it the, the ear smoothie, to make the, the ink of that autologous cartilage and print it to exact shape. 
The same will be with bone, the, the, the surgeon's transplant uh, pieces of a bone, and we will homogenize it to the paste to be able to print it into the 3D shape. The next application will be like those uh, bio-ink derived part for the nose and, and also ear. So, uh, say a plastic surgeon used it for a nose, you could envisage them using it as a design on a computer screen. Exactly, exactly, exactly. And, and, and one of the, uh, we have started the larger animal study, we will now, after a month, put the skin under the, on, the, on the implant, so the mouse skin to see if it's nicely integrated with the skin. So you, can, you, you will be able to, to form, the, particularly on, those, uh, on the trauma, when the, the large pieces of soft tissue are, are missing, it, it, we will be able to reconstruct that with Pascal. Thank you. Okay, Doug? Uh, Doug Dollamore, ACS Office of Public Affairs. This is more of a clarification than, a, than really a question. Um, I, th I think I heard the answer um, in your, your, your last little bit. But um, th these, the live cells that you're embedding into the bioink, those come directly from the patient? Or they they come directly from the patient. So there wouldn't be a problem with rejection? No. And also, uh, the things what we have did, uh, from the, for the chondrocytes, it's always lack of cells. Because you don't have you don't have much of, a, of you cannot take a large biopsy from knee when you have osteoarthritis, for example. So what we did now here, we add 80 percent of bone marrow derived stem cells to mix with 20 percent of chondrocytes, and that 80 percent of bone marrow derived stem cells uh, affect enormously chondrocytes to proliferate and produce a cartilage. In next trial, which we start in May, we will actually use a fat tissue to derivate stem cells, adipose derivate stem cells, which we, many of us have a lot of that. And it's actually procedures now in operation room take about half an hour to isolate the adipose derivate stem cells. So our vision is to do it everything in the surgery room. And one, one quick question about um, th these um, 3D printed um, this 3D printed cartilage. Have you compared it to um, healthy uh, regular cartilage? Does it have the same durability and flexibility? Uh, no, we can do it first when we come, come into human or, or a larger animal. Because this, this stage, we just put it in the skin. So what we see is that the, the human cells produce the cartilage, uh, but we need to have the right amount of cells, so we need to have more cells, and probably put into the defects also. So I, I would say the next step would be, would be probably the, a larger animal and maybe, the, maybe bovine cells or uh, maybe porcine uh, with the porcine cells in the defect. So we can, say, we can see that the cells now grow in the defect because there's a lot of signals also from the defect. Just another question. It's Kath from CNI magazine again. Um, what was the function of the nanocellulose? I'm not quite clear. Why very good question. It, it's, a, it's a very um, shared thinning dispersion. So these are the very fine fibrils, or nanofibrils. They are 10 nanometers in diameter, uh, several microns in length. They hold a lot of water, and they uh, reorient in the flow. So uh, this... Uh, ink, which I show here, have 2% dry content, but it's like a paste. And what does it help? Firstly, that it's cell-friendly material, it's a lot of water, and we can print those fine structures with uh, uh, lines which are not thicker than 200, 300 micron. If we don't do it, the cell will die. So it's, it's the, the real importance, it's, it's a providing this fine printing fidelity. Some people say about uh, you, you know, when you think about the writing and you write with a pen which is leaking on a, on a paper which is very absorbing, uh, that's a bad pr printing fidelity. And when you take a very nice pen like Parker and get a very smooth paper, you can, pre pr pr uh, you can write the, the fine lines. And, and that has to do with, with uh, viscoelastic properties. So the, the, the fibrils orient in the, in the flow, the shear thinning. And they don't damage the, the cells. So they b both provide the, the support, but also they become very low viscosity when it's come to the nozzle of the printer. But after printing, they stay there. 
So we recover very viscosity. And that is really the, the, the most important part. And also after cross-linking with calcium, we have small, smaller amount of alginate, more uh, nanocellulose. Uh, we, when we cross-link with calcium, uh, the, this is a construct with 98% water. And it's such a good mechanical properties. So it's, it's a very good environment for cell to grow, as long as they have oxygen and nutrients. OK, thank you very much for joining us. Um, the archived version of this session will soon be posted at bit.ly slash ACS Live San Diego. Please join us for our next press conference today at 10 o'clock on cellular backpacks for treating disease. Thank you.